All right, we are live. Hooray. Welcome, everybody. We are live on Monday, the 13th of December, 2021. What do we got? 12 days left till Christmas and however many hours. My, my daughter keeps reminding us again and again and again <laughs> of the, well, hold on, let me kill that sound, um, that we are coming so close to this glorious holiday, right? You know, any... Um, Anyone here who, uh, and I think many of us uh, celebrate Christmas, I like to uh, I like to get down to the simplicity of it, right? So when we really get down to it, it's Christian holiday. It's a major, major, major Christian holiday, and yet we've got uh, we've got a lot of uh, you know the whole commercialism thing that's been built up around it, mispronunciations of Saint Nicholas, you know, and all that. Uh, how did St. Nicholas turn into this like huge guy in a red suit? I don't know. It's interesting uh, evolution. But uh, <laughs> in fact, anybody ever seen the movie, The Christmas Chronicles? Great movie, I think. Um, uh, was it? Uh, uh, oh, my goodness. Who's the actor who played Wyatt Earp in Tombstone? And Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell plays Santa. Yeah. Spectacular. Well done. Very well done movie. So uh, I get to watch uh, you know Christmas movies with my daughter. And we get to have, uh, you know, festivities and all that. Of course, this year we're going to be moving. So uh, that's that's what my Christmas is going to look like. So very different. Uh, but right now, since we do have 12 days left, uh, we're going to be getting together here for every single one of them, except Christmas Eve. I think we're going to take that Friday off. Uh, today, in fact, we do have here in our in our mastermind group, we do have our book study where we're going on to the part four of uh, Joseph Murphy's classic, uh, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. So everybody tune into that. We've been getting a lot of mileage out of that book. I'm really excited that we're, we're reading it because once again, it's one of, those, one of those books that was recommended to me right as I was becoming successful in business. Uh, it had a big influence on me. And the concepts aren't earth shattering, you know, there's no new truth or anything like that. But the way he presented them and the fact that he did present them again and again from multiple different angles is what uh, allowed me, I think, um, allowed me to put more of it to use than I might have done had I just read, you know, other great books, right? Think and Grow Rich and, and you know, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And there's a big, you know, volume of work in those. But the way uh, Murphy kind of hits it from all these different angles and keeps it really simple, I think allowed it to be more usable for me. And that's certainly well, my goodness, what are we doing here, right? Why is the, what is the whole intention of, of this group and these conversations that we have is that we actually get to put stuff to use. So we can call that integrity, right? Otherwise we could just sit around and read books and, you know, theorize, right? For whatever that's worth. Uh, I heard someone once say that, you know, intellectual understanding is, is the booby prize, right? That's, you lose, right? If that's as far as you take it. All right. That's the booby prize. What we're actually looking for is the fruit on the tree. In fact, I just had a conversation with uh, some some people who are seeking guidance in terms of their new you know, business ventures. And uh, and I made this I made this uh, this comment to them, which seemed to be a breakthrough. And it is a breakthrough for for some people. And that is that uh, while you've got while you've got all the how to theory right? Here's the instructions. I mean, you right now you can go read an instruction manual on anything, right? Uh, pick a piece of electronics or something and get the instruction manual. And when you read that manual, you will then be the possessor of theory. Here's how it's supposed to work. Okay. And yet, if we never touch the machine and actually press the buttons, and pull the levers and see the fruit of that action, right? See the result of it. Well, then we, we get theory only. You know, this is, and I didn't had, I had no idea I was going to go down this road this morning, but this is what's coming up for me. This is the problem with most education, so-called education. So picture this. You've got, and some of you have done this, right? So you're, you're in the, the university and you're receiving the uh, lecture from the professor 
who, who didn't get results in that field either, which is why they're a professor. Otherwise, they'd be in the field doing work, <laughs> making money. OK, what's the old saying? Those who can do those who can't teach. But uh, so here's the, the professor. And uh, and here's the theory, ladies and gentlemen, theory, theory, theory. You're never going to actually use any of this. But here's the theory. And weigh yourself down with that. You damn well better have the right answers when we when we examine you on your retention of the theory. But none of it's real. Like, what does it all mean? Like in the world. Now, granted, I'm, I'm making a generality. Certainly there are people who, let's say, for example, they're in a high level calculus class or something. And, and there is the need for calculus in the world where we're measuring the various curves and dimensions of, you know, and building skyscrapers and, and whatever you use calculus for. I, I don't, obviously I don't. So for me, speaking for myself, that would terminate, the, the height of mastery for that would terminate at a head full of theory, but no practical application. Why? I, I'm just not engaged. I'm not engaged in that, in those actions that require calculus. But for, but for business, Okay, let's say you're learning e-commerce, or you're learning uh, network marketing, or you're learning uh, sales, right? Which all have different nuance to it, right? The nuance of that. We've got to be able to mesh the theory with practical application. In other words, we've got to find a way to balance what we're taking in and what we're putting out, the inflow, the outflow, the theory with the practical application. And when we do that, uh, now what? It, it's, it's a very... Um, freeing it's a freeing thing when we have when we have experiential knowledge not just theoretical knowledge or intellectual knowledge but when we have experiential knowledge isn't it true that any one of you can can go and uh, uh, do some task back to the idea of a, a machine a piece of electronics or something and now that you've got experiential knowledge let's say a car a toaster a microwave a washing machine now that you've got experiential knowledge, of how that machine works and the result that you intend to get with that machine. You no longer need the theory. You've got it. You own it. Okay. And now without looking at the, the manual or a cheat sheet or something, you can produce a pleasing result. My toaster, my toaster. Okay. So there are settings on the toaster, you see, and some are lighter and darker, right? And then you push the handle down and the toast goes down. And then, you know, if the handle comes up, the toast comes up, but there's only one way to get the handle up and it's not to force it. There's a little cancel button underneath the, the, the plunger, right? You push that and then it releases the spring and then the toast comes up early if you want to cancel the, you know, the action, right? There's even a bagel setting in case you're putting like some thick bread in there. And, and so um, I got all that in theory, but it wasn't until, it wasn't until I started toasting breads of various types that I learned where to set the settings on the darkness of the toast. And whether or not I should put the bagel setting on or how to abort, abort, cancel if I made the wrong choice, right? I don't need the instruction manual anymore. But it is kind of funny that when I got this freaking toaster, actually, my wife got it. We had a toaster oven, which I thought was fine, but it has to heat up the whole damn oven to finally get the toast hot. So she was like, we need an actual toaster where the, you know, it's that much space, right? And it toasts the bread. And that's it. It's done. And, and so, all right, get the freaking toaster. So she spent... $14 on this toaster. And I had to read the manual because I couldn't figure out how to get the handle up. I said it wrong. And then I saw, oh, there's the cancel button right there. So this may sound too simple, but think of the difference between John with a bunch of theory versus John with experiential knowledge of how to get the result that I want to get with the machine. I don't care about the methods. I care about the result. And when I could take theory, whether we're talking about how, how we think, right? With the books that we're reading, or we're talking about um, toasting bread or, or, or whatever. When, when I own the theory, now it's not just intellectualizing or philosophizing. Now it's the end result in mind is the properly toasted bread. That's the end result by whatever means, which I will now decide. And in fact, I am competent enough to make those decisions. Before, when I was incompetent, incompetent. I, not only did I not get the pleasing result that I wanted, maybe I get lucky here and there, but, but, you know, at the same time, the frustration that goes with that. Think about this, everybody. You, you want the result of, uh, I don't know, pick a goal, whatever, whatever goal you're working on, and hopefully you are, okay? But how do we get there? See, this is where it gets subjective and frustrating and whatever for a lot of people when they are not 
they're not clear about how how their mind works and you know what they're thinking so so maybe we'll try this maybe we'll try that i'm not quite sure well i read in this one book over there but you know what this other guy contradicted that and so i'm not sure which one to believe you guys remember the example i gave a few weeks back of little don i know missy remembers this don my friend when he was a boy up in Rhode Island, trying to get the wheel off the car, wasn't sure to turn right or turn left. And it wasn't until he got one datum, righty tighty, lefty loosey, that's just one datum, all right? He got that one thing in his head, he owned it, and then he experienced it, lefty loosey, bam, broke the nuts free, and was able to get the wheel off the car. And from that day forward, experiential knowledge. But up until that point, frustration. In theory, yes, you turn a nut and it gets tighter or looser. That's the theory. Does that, does that bear fruit? Not for little Don until he got the prime data, which is righty tighty lefty loosey, which is almost always the case except big trucks. But, <clears throat> but in that case, that, that was, that was beneficial. And the frustration evaporated. The definiteness of purpose, decision, action was immediate. And so when we study the things that we're studying here, and thank you for bearing with me on my very trite and mundane examples of toasters and lug nuts, okay? But I mean, how different is it really with what we're attempting to accomplish? Yeah, we've got a few more moving parts. Or we've got no moving parts, except in, inside here, inside our braids, right? So there's all the moving parts. But all the other data, all the other facts, all the tools and machinery and physical world stuff, it's the same stuff. We're just rearranging the stuff. So it's not like we're, we're adding a new truth or something. We're, we're just, we're looking to create order first inside and then outside. What else is goal achievement besides creating order? Uh, I decided I'm going to build this structure, you see? And it's going to be a beautiful skyscraper or whatever it is, right? And that material, steel, glass, wood, marble, whatever, right? That material already exists. I'm not saying, hey, somebody bring another planet over here because we need some steel or something. No, no, it's already here, all right? We're just looking to, to create order out of all this random material. But it starts right here. We don't build the skyscraper until we have the blueprint. That is the creation of order. Here come the engineers, the architects, the people who know about load bearing structures, not to mention aesthetics, right? Which is subjective. What do you want it to look like, right? So there are people who can, who can create order on paper before it shows up on the physical world, right? But even before it gets on the paper, there's got to be order here, right? We, we can't give what we don't got. So so I'm thinking the, the path that we're on now with this whole idea of, of orderly thought, which leads to orderly movement, I think is the, the greatest pursuit you could ever have. <clears throat> Look, we've seen example after example right here in this group, example after example of people who have become authorities, masters, I might even say, at, at certain things, which they weren't prior. Was anyone here born as a master of e-commerce or sales or whatever you're engaged in? No, no. Well, sales, maybe. I don't know. That one we could argue, I suppose. Babies are, babies tend to get what they want and their communication isn't even that good. Actually, it is, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not complicated. It's simple. And they, they get what they want, right? Um, I, I would say, and I've said it before, that I'm, I'm blessed in the way that I had to learn how to sell early growing up in an abusive environment and all this, I mean, you got to damn well better learn how to convince and communicate pretty quick, right? So, so uh, advantage, which ostensibly doesn't seem like an advantage, but now that I look back, I'm like, my goodness. But you see, these are tools of the trade. So what are your tools? And do you have experiential knowledge of them? One of them, regardless of what enterprise or actions we're engaged in, one of them must be the sustained and consecutive thought of the person operating that enterprise or that body or that, you know, whatever it is that you're doing with your time here. <laughs> okay. So uh, in, in sales and marketing, for example, um, I already mentioned the, the tool of all tools, the most paramount tool of all is communication by whatever means. Okay. Talking, 
video, email, carrier pigeon, smoke signals, interpretive dance. I don't care about the method. I care about the result. Do we have any interpretive dance experts here? <laughs> Giovanna, interpretive dance, please. Hey, don't Start. be laughing, John. I majored in dance at UCLA. That's why I went there. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> okay, that's great. I um, All I know about interpretive dance is like comedy routines. Uh, so I've never... Um, Perhaps I'm ignorant. Uh, in fact, I, I guarantee you I'm ignorant in the ways of interpretive dance. So, but thank you, Janet. Um, that being said, Sorry, whatever Jim, the method, yeah, go yeah, ahead. You asked Giovanna and I jumped in. So Giovanna, please answer. I, I was just making light. I was just, yeah, I was just, <laughs> I was just engaging in Giovanna's uh, whatever. So, so the idea that we could, by whatever methods, communicate an idea uh, to someone we intend to receive it and take some sort of action, right? Uh, that is paramount for anyone engaged in sales, marketing, commerce, right? And the methods may change, but the, the truth of it, the underlying truth of it is still there. It, it, can't, it can't occur though without order. Think of it like this. Um, if you said A, B, C, D to, to a child and they, and they responded back, B, C, A, D, right? That would be what? A disorder of the same data. Uh, but when they were able to, to duplicate what you did, right? A, B, C, D. Oh, A, B, C, D. I got it. So order was communicated, received, and now they are able to, to do what? To go forth into the world and, and create additional order. Now, I personally, I, I'll tell you, I love, I love order. I cannot stand disorder. And right now, well, you guys can't see, I got boxes here where I think the next time you see me, that shelf is going to be empty, right? So that's what I get to live in for a couple of weeks. But the, um, but you see, we're, we're creating order ahead of time because we're going to be vacating these residences. So, uh, so out of that chaos, there is an order, underlying order underneath all of it. And when we look at anything we've ever succeeded in, it's been a successful creation or maintenance of an orderly state. And again, as within, so without. So I think, and I don't have a whole lot more to say about this, but, but I think that anything you can do, back to my original point here, uh, anything you can do to commingle theory with practical application, thereby creating order, not only in terms of your intellectual understanding or ability to recite, right? To, to your ability to, to pass the examination for whatever it's worth, okay? Which may or may not be worth something in the marketplace. I don't know, but that, that's one piece of it. But in addition to that, if we commingle that with, with practical application, now I don't need to read the instruction manual anymore. I've got order right here. And then I can go so much faster, so much faster. You know, I think about, uh, competence, the idea of competence and, and speed, right? And if we're talking about business, of course, you know, uh, speed is a good thing, right? Money likes speed, doesn't like sitting there in a state of indecision or whatever, but the more competent I become, the faster I can go. I, I, uh, when I was first learning how to drive a car, I was incompetent and I was in the uh, parking lot with this car. And uh, we were just driving around and there's nothing to hit, thankfully, and uh, learning about the, you know, the angles of the steering wheel and overcompensating. Like, I need to turn this wheel to get the car to go. No, it's little, small little adjustments, right? Gas pedal, vroom, right? Brakes. And so that is incompetence. That is theory. Yes, accelerator pedal, brake pedal. In theory, I get it. But the practical application of that, once I got that, is anyone here um, looking for the pedals or wondering where to put their hands on the steering wheel? No, I mean, you're, you're competent. You got it. And the more competent you are, the faster you go. I don't longer drive at, at 15 miles an hour in a, in a parking lot. Well, actually, I do every time I go to a parking lot. But, uh, but, you know, there's such a thing as a highway, right? We have what's called Interstate 10. I'm going to be seeing a lot of it here in a couple of weeks. 
And uh, I can tell you right here in Arizona, speed limit 75, largely unenforced. Do whatever you want, right? I have no problem doing 90 miles an hour on a state. Did I just say that? You know what? I heard that other people, let me publicly state that. I heard that other people drive at 90 miles an hour on interstate time. I mean, personally, you know, 74 and a half is my limit. Now, you know, actually, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm giving you lots of tangents today, but you know what got me to slow down? I used to be a lead foot. I drove my Maserati and oh my goodness, I used to be a lead foot. You know what cured me of that? Getting a motorcycle. You want to see how fast 70 miles an hour really is when it's going past you this far from your feet, right there, right there. Yeah, now you know how fast that is, right? So uh, that cooled me off a bit. Um, anyway, I love you guys. Uh, now is time for Janet to dance. So I will stop talking. <laughs> love you guys. Uh, any thoughts about, about this whole idea of, of speed and competence and commingling theory with, with practical application? Have you seen this in your own life, whether we're talking about toasters or business or how your mind works. Missy, please come on out. Yes, I've seen it in Etsy. Amazon, I ain't seeing it. Mm. Uh, and then this other project I'm doing where I'm selling some products, I that was like going to the moon to me. And now it's feeling more comfortable. I am faster. I am more competent in what I'm saying. I don't have to look at anything uh, with, a, with some exception. And I, I know what I'm doing. And I, it feels good. The only thing I don't have mastered is uh, proper order and um, uh, getting everything organized. I have like 10,000 check checklists and check sheets. So it's like having none. Mm. So I, you know, and then I lose them. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it. That was never my strong suit, um, but it shall be. Right. So 10,000 check sheets, is there a way to compress that into one? Like here's the yes, most. Right. Yeah. Of course. But I was just, you know, in a pit of panic. I was just like, about that. So, mm. um, and then it all gets lost. So now that I'm more comfortable, um, it's going to come easier. Okay. I know that for sure. Right. Right. I know that, you know, the old saying, confuse them, you lose them. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so all these different, you know, undone half a check sheet here and there. Yeah, that's, well, that's rough. Right. Gail, what do you think? We got Gail here, ladies and gentlemen, live from the road. Hi, Gail. Yeah, I just came out of the doctor's office. Oh, you look um, great. Thank you. Love your uh, sweater. I, <laughs> I didn't hear all of the, the thing, but except for the last bit with about order in your life and in your business. And I know for me, when things are disordered, even if it's on a desk, it just, cl it's the clutter slows me down. Mm -hmm. It makes me, I don't know what's the word. I feel insecure. I think, am I going to be able to find this or do that? If everything is in order, things go much more smoothly. I feel better. Mm -hmm. um, it helps my mental attitude. So I'm not sure if that goes exactly with what you were talking about, but that's what I got from the last bit that I listened to. Sure. Of course it does. And, and we're talking about speed as it relates to orderliness or competence, right? So, so let's say that you have a disordered state of, of your materials or your tools or whatever. Uh, does that cost you time? Of course. Of course. Yeah. So many people spend like half their life just looking for stuff. Where's my mm -hmm. phone? Where's my keys? Where's my, right? And so, and so if we could eliminate that, that's, there's the value of order. I don't even have to look anymore. I, I think we, we brought this example up last week. Here's the, the police officer where their gear is on their vest, on their belt. They don't have to look. They know exactly where the hand goes for that, right? Yeah. That, that renders speed, right? Mm -hmm. Which they damn well better have. So um, thank you, Gail. And uh, so you just got out of the doctor's office. Looks like a beautiful yeah, day. Good, good report. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah you My got sun. All good. Globin is good. Everything's good. Nice. Well, we are so glad for you. No more bar fights for you. I know you <laughs> like to. <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know, uh, you know, Gail had a little bruise or something, uh, but uh, <laughs> I accused her of being in a barroom brawl. Yeah. That was not a, 
accurate uh, accusation. Anyway, so uh, good times. Thank you, Gail. Anybody else have some thoughts on this? Is there something you can you can bring order into your life in some way? Janet, you have some thoughts on this? Uh, I have some thoughts, um, but you know, you're um, mostly overall, John. I totally agree with you, and and I think I'm seeking more order in my life. Just you know, just for what I'm wanting to do, etc. I you know, the the desire to to go forward creates the desire for order. So you know, and and you're right. You know, when you, when you've got it, when you've got the information inside of you, then you can go faster. You can do better, and it's always incrementally. You know, like Missy's saying that we, you know, she's learning. She's learning something. Now she's got it. Now she's going on to the next thing. It's you know, it's a progressive kind of thing. Um, I have to say that I think the the best teachers are those who can do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. those who have been there, those who know the path, those who know how to, uh, what leads to what, you know, so I, I'm not really into that old adage so much, I suppose, because I am teaching a lot, but, <laughs> but, you know, um, yes, if you're only from book knowledge to book knowledge, you haven't tried it out. And my dad who, who worked, um, oh, he put in power plants all over the the United States. And, you know, he'd say, you know, these young guys, they come in with all this book learning, but that's, they don't know how it really is in the real world. And, and he, he railed against that. Now, he was intelligent, but didn't have the opportunity for education, unfortunately, but um, he, you know, he really knew what he could read blueprints that most people couldn't do, etc. He had skills, but but he knew how it was. He, he knew he knew on the ground how it was. And these people who had only book learning had not filled in all the spots, you know, between. Also, you know, of course, your um, your manuals and things like that are not usually well written. <laughs> they're not usually written by they're probably more written by theorists than by practical people. How to get from this step to that step. But it's not easy to write. Um, instructions and to write manuals so often you're left out there hanging and experience is what you need really to fill in all those blanks so um mm. so it's both the fault of the of the person who wrote the manual and um you know and then yes filling filling in it and getting it doing it, it because you you have questions that get answered in the practical sense right so, you know right you, you just think you're you think okay but but it doesn't it's not it's not smooth the the theoretical is bit by bit by bit but it's not a smooth progress through all of the steps that you need and so i think anything in um in doing we need to we need to go through it. We need to experience it. And then it starts to, I go back to my books. I go back to my, to my theory. I go back to, wait a minute, there's something I didn't get, but eventually, eventually you, you do get it. And I think that's, yeah, you're, you're so right with that. So well, I like Janet, it. You could explain calligraphy to me, you know, with, with theory uh, and you hold the quill with a 25 degree angle and then, uh, you know, when you curve to this direction, you relieve pressure and uh, by 84 percent, I'm like, oh, my goodness. So that's and I'm just making this up as I go. You understand. But but the, the difference between that and quill in hand, right, touching paper, completely different experience. Now Absolutely. it's real. Right. Absolutely. And then it starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's a it's a dance. It's a play between. Um, hearing instruction and doing mm -hmm. and, and back and forth until you are ready to hear the thing. It, it, we, we can get a lot of stuff being told to us and we can be working on it, but it's not until we're ready to hear it. Do we hear it? Um, it can be told to you 10 times, but it's not mm -hmm. until your experience uh, catches up with what's being told to you that you are now ready to hear it and to put it into action. So it's not a one-to-one, -one. Mm, it might be a right. one to 10. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, and then we're gonna to go to Glenn. Uh, it also has to be willingness on the part of the student to listen to that particular messenger. How often 
and I'll say this quietly, how often do I have some, you know, advice or suggestion that my wife is from down the hall? (laughs) Yeah. But, but then, but then somebody else tells her and it's a breakthrough. Oh my goodness. We've never heard that before. Wow. Uh, (laughs) Just as long as I don't say it. Uh, What do you think, Glenn? Let's get Glenn out here. What's Uh, up, Glenn? Yeah, like the old saying goes, uh, kids, teenagers will take advice, encouragement, tips, support from everyone in the world, except mom and dad. Right. <laughs> well, it's good to see you again, my friend. I am, as you can see, safety first. Yeah. I'm on the way out to the, uh, the warehouse, the factory. Can you believe this? Where we're going to be building uh, our new uh, smoker pits. I can't. It, um, well, I won't say that. I can't believe it's still the whole thing is still sort of surreal to mm. me. Uh, I just signed a financing deal for a forklift. John, I don't even know how to drive a forklift. <laughs> what the heck am I doing with a forklift? But you know, I, I actually do. I yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's do, let's do a little Zoom master class <laughs> on uh, forklift drive. Anyway. Uh, it's great for that. You, I, the part that I heard uh, following on the heels of <clears throat> Gail's uh, partial listeningness or hearing ness, my partial hearing ness, what had to do with order. And you said something about undone things. And is there a way to compress all the to do lists into one? Uh, as you know, uh, as you well know about me, John, one of the most efficient ways for me to begin to achieve order in my life is by letting go of stuff. Mm-hmm. Letting go of uh, things that seemed like a good idea, adventures that seemed like a good idea at the time, ideas which pass through my, uh, but you know, artsy fartsy three in the morning musician brain, uh, but it, then trying to get them implemented and, and, and being punched in the face yet again with the reality that there are only 24 hours in the day. Uh, and so for me, what has been happening the last few weeks is a kind of ordering by reordering, um, streamlining by subtraction, if that makes any sense. Um, things that I was doing that I don't really need to be doing anymore and, and, and ventures that were at one time like a great idea, but you know, thanks any, right now. And I may come back to that. It really is a good idea. I may come back to it at some point in the future. Right now, I need to focus and master this. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. I need to focus and master this uh, or this smaller set of priorities. And what I'm noticing is that in the past month at, at least you know very much you know but i'm noticing it very much in the past month is that in those areas which i have chose where i've chosen to put my focus where i'm choosing to put my focus and my effort for some strange reason stats are going way up picture mm-hmm. that picture that and so uh many of uh, uh, no I will speak only for myself. I can only speak for myself and say that there are things on my to-do list that just don't need to get done today or this month or in the next six months. There are ventures that, you know, as I said, there are things I don't need to do right now. And as, as attractive as it may be, as attractive as it may appear to do, you know, to, to take the time to do that thing right now, it takes time and mental energy away from what I should be focusing on, what I need to be focusing on. And so for me, it's, it's a process of streamlining. It's a process of narrowing, of releasing unproductive priorities. And that is bringing some more order into my world. Look at, it helps somebody in, uh, you know, we don't have to do everything. Mm. Having it sounds nice. Yeah, right. Back to- awesome. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, I, we can't be all things to all people all the time either, right? I guess would be another way of saying that. So, uh, so choose, right? I know. Um, I think it was Missy and I had a conversation the other day where 
uh, the cognition was uh, you can't have everything, but you can't have anything. So choose, choose, what are you going to have? All right. So thank you all. Any other, any other hands? I don't see any other hands, any other thoughts. Hey, Virginia, you know, that truck that, that Glenn's driving, we got to ride around in that beauty, that black beauty right there. Yeah. I t that's probably my next vehicle. Ram limited. Oh my goodness. Beautiful car. Um, all right. Anybody else? Last call. Last call. We'll go ahead and wrap up with that. I'm going to be back here with you all at 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. Four more chapters of The uh, Power of Your Subconscious Mind, Joseph Murphy. And uh, in the meantime, have an awesome day. I'll see you guys. Oh, wait, here, here comes Giovanna. Hold on. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to hear from Giovanna. Just really quick, um, I used to live on in Venice on the beach and uh, they would have surf school and I would see the, the lifeguards going on and on, giving lots of instructions and they would practice different steps. And I met this woman and she surfed and I told her that was really cool. I would love to surf. And she said, meet me Saturday. And um, we w I paddled out in like a leotard and she faced me toward the beach and she just yelled, paddle. That's that, that was the extent of how I learned how to surf. My friend yelling at the top of her lungs to paddle. And um, I learned pretty quickly. <laughs> I don't see how I could have learned that on the beach. So. All right. <laughs> there you go. Paddle. Giovanna, so good to see you. Thank you for your input. All right, guys. Then with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I will see you all back here tomorrow.